Can everybody hear me? Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Matthew Lake here. Today, I'm going to be talking about cross-car games for semi-autonomous driving. I want to welcome you inside the car of the future. This car is able to autonomously drive itself for short periods of time, at least. It has full window heads-up displays, so you can project arbitrary content on any of the windows. It is vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, uh, so cars know where they are relative to each other on the road. And it is motion tracking, so you know where the position of the passengers are and their smartphones inside of the car. In this work, we have two main contributions. We used a research-through-design approach to develop cross-car games as design artifacts. And also, we created a characterization of a design space for in-car games. We know that people like to play games with others that are around them. With games like Ingress and Pokemon Go, people have made comments like, you get to go out into the world to play, you get to bring video games into real life, and you get to meet with people in the real world. So how can we bring these experiences to in-car entertainment? We created games in a class of games that we call cross-car games. These are games that you play in your car with other people in their cars in the road environment. Of course, since the technologies I just mentioned before don't all exist together in one car right now, we created a virtual reality driving simulator. So in the simulator, cars autonomously drive along the road, and 2D heads of displays on all windows display the content. This is what the environment looks like. So the My Player Zero, that's displayed on the heads of display, but everything else is just the cars driving along. This is the environment that the games happen in. So we created three different uh, cross-car games representative of different genres, killer ball, billiards, and decoration. In interest of time, though, I'm just going to focus on billiards. So billiards, unlike the name might suggest, doesn't actually have to do too much with billiards. It's more inspired by a mobile phone game called Peggle. Uh, so the way billiards works is cars that are nearby are divided up into small groups for short periods of time, and then within these groups, one car is assigned the role of a launcher, and then the other cars are assigned the role of bouncers. So the role, the, basically the point of the game is to have the launcher get the ball to the target car. So one car is indicated as a target. Uh, but they want to bounce off as many intermediate cars as possible to maximize the number of points that they get. Uh, the role of the bouncers is to help get that ball towards the target, call, car, target car. So if it goes astray, then they can help redirect it. So here's a video of what the gameplay looks like. In this first round, I'm the bouncer, and the car behind me wants to get the ball towards the car beside me. So I help redirect that ball to that car. In the second round, I'm the launcher, and I want to try and launch to the car in front of me. So I bounce off the car beside me for extra bonus points. We went through a weekly iterative process of designing and playtesting the games, and we learned some interesting lessons for this that we contribute as design considerations for cross-car games. The first is exemplified by this image over here. So we can see there's some arrows in the back, like back window, and it's sort of unclear what they represent. This is because the actual frame of the car that we're in is occluding it. It's occluding game elements that occur in the immediate vicinity of the car. So we recommend using alternative visualizations to show these extra elements. So for example, in billiards, we had a bird's eye view on the user's virtual smartphone. So we can see in this case, oh, that car behind me is actually trying to launch the car diagonally in front of me. And so the extra context contextual information is helpful. Another design consideration focuses around comfort and safety. We found especially early on that participants were trying to turn in really weird ways because they weren't used to playing games inside of their car, or at least not, not like immersive games like this. Um, and so to help try and mitigate this, we recommend that games explicitly try and provide ways to guide users into more comfortable positions. So for example, in billiards, we added these arrows to the heads-up displays. Uh, and so this helps guide users' gaze toward where the action is happening, so they don't have to try and bend around awkwardly to figure out what's going on. We also conducted a primarily qualitative 12-participant evaluation of the games. Uh, in this uh, study, each participant played all three games against simulated other players. Some key results were that co-located um, co play was found to be very enjoyable by the players, for example, some players reported that they could perform impromptu relationships with other people on the road environment. Another interesting result was that players were highly immersed, as measured uh, by the Player Experience Inventory, or PXI, questionnaire. 
So crossguard games are one type of game that we might see in cars going forward. What other types of games are in cars, and how can we categorize them? To do this, we created a characterization of a design space for all in-car games. You can see this table over here. Is in the, this is one of the table that's in the paper. This categorizes a bunch of past work against the dimensions that we developed, which are on the right. Uh, to understand a bit how these dimensions work, I'll use the example of our cross-car games and some examples of how we can characterize them. So our cross-car games are multiplayer uh, between cars, which means that you're playing with multiple people in other cars, as opposed to within car, you're not playing with somebody who's currently in your car with you. Cross-car uh, games have co-located, uh, active, co active involvement of co-located cars, which means the other cars on the road are actually playing the game with you. This is opposed to passive involvement, where the cars aren't providing, other cars aren't providing any input. And present, in terms of presentation, so this is the way the game is presented to you. Uh, the content is displayed on the mobile device, so as we saw with the bird's eye view, you can see content on your smartphone, and then also content's displayed on the heads-up display, so we can see the game events as they unfold in world space. Also from this design space, we identified some gaps that might lead to interesting research going forward. The first is games that leverage different traffic environments. For example, could we design new game mechanics around, for example, going underneath a bridge or going into a traffic circle? Next is team-based and competitive in-car games. So I talked a bit about ingress before. How could we bring like, the team aspect of ingress to in-car games? Games that influence the driving route. Say, for example, could we design games that gamify shopping routes to minimize your fuel usage? And cross-car games, which was the main focus of this work. Some other more general future work going forward is how can we integrate more story-filled and adventure-type games into the car, and games that people can form more emotional relationships with? And then also, what kind of it interfaces will people use to join or leave games? So suppose I get into my car and I want to play billiards. What interface do I actually use to choose to engage with these games? So in summary, we created cross-car games as design artifacts and a characterization of a design space for in-car games. Thanks. Uh, Daniel Johnson, <laughs> Queensland University of Technology. Um, thank you for this. It's very interesting work. It's my it's check, check, check. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it is. Um, Daniel Johnson, Queensland University of Technology. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, we're doing some work in this space, and for us, um, that it's been really important to determine the goal of our game. So where, because it's semi-autonomous cars, you know that you'll need to have takeover requests, right? So the person has to stay aware enough to be ready for when the car goes, uh-oh, you need to be a human now. Um, is that considered in your work or is this more about entertaining the player and not necessarily worrying about that sort of situation? So the, the main focus of the work was on game design. We did include an artificial takeover task. I've actually got an extra bonus video over here awesome. for it if you want. It's not an actual takeover task. It's more symbolic just to assess reaction time. Sure. So it would display a takeover prompt. Um, did it already happen? Or is this, no, this is a decoration. One sec, one more video ahead. Um, so it displays a takeover prompt and then they have to identify an object in the environment and turn the virtual steering wheel towards it. So it's sort of to assess reaction time. Um, it's really hard to assess in virtual reality, though. And so our results, I think, com for comparing the games to each other had some good validity. But in terms of external validity, I think more work is needed. Yeah, cool. Well, we should chat more because we're struggling with the same thing. And it's, as you're aware, quite a problem. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Shringi, University of York, London. So uh, you talked about implementing the bird's eye view as a solution for, because there were obstructions in the car thing. Uh, my question is, uh, are there other design considerations that you tested against that, or that was your only solution? The reason I ask that is because since it's a fast-paced game, I understand that you're mimicking a smartphone, but actual driving is a slower, like, slower navigation process than looking at the bounce. So now your players are looking at the bird's eye view more than the, the road itself. So did you see these kind of problems and what are the other design solutions that you tested this against if you did? 
I think, I mean, so in terms of billiards, this was the main, the main implementation of that. Uh, we didn't actually find participants staring at the phone screen too much. I think we partially helped this because we didn't show all the game content on the actual smartphone as well. It was only key things that were easily obscured. And so I think this helped players more focus on the environment around them. But it's sort of people were just taking like quick glances and then continuing to look at the environment. And did you try anything else at all? For the other games, yes. For billiards, that was about it. Oh, okay. Hello. Hello, Patrick Dickinson from the University of Lincoln. Um, thanks for your presentation, it was really interesting. I, I was particularly interested in the way that you use VR to create, you know, to, to simulate a realistic or real scenario um, where someone would be playing this game. Um, so I was wondering, when you were talking about, for example, the players felt immersed in the game, whether you did anything to kind of differentiate their feelings of immersion from being in VR, being in that simulation, from actually playing the game. Yeah, so that's definitely a confound. So I think future work definitely would be needed in terms of like, once we can actually put these games in a real car, that'll be the real tell of whether these are actually as immersive as we think. But one thing for sure is that, at least in our qualitative interviews, participants talked a lot about how immersed they felt in the games compared to like a mobile phone game, which is what the, basically what they would normally play in their car. And so at least compared to that, I think there is a step up, even though, like whether or not it's VR. Floyd Muller, Exertion Games Lab, Melbourne, Australia. Um, we also um, uh, played in that space, and I played some of these uh, uh, similar games, and I was always wondering, I mean, you make the assumption that the car now has motion control, right? But you already have a steering wheel in front of you. Like if you take, you know, like the, um, uh, those semi-autonomous cars that still need a steering wheel. Why don't we just use that as the interface? Like why do we need motion control if we have... Uh, perfectly fine physical hardware interface that we used for many, many years. So I guess there's, there's two reasons to that. The first is that for semi-autonomous cars, those controls are still important for actual driving. So until cars become fully autonomous, or autonomous enough that you can like, use these controls independently of the car while it's driving itself, that's not really viable. Um, why, why, why not? Like If I play with it when it's in autonomous mode, I can play with it to control the game, and when I take over, it controls the car. So I mean, like, take, take the steering wheel, for example. I think most autonomous car implementations right now, like, physically turn the steering wheel. So you'll see the steering wheel turn itself. If that's not true, then maybe that's an interesting place for exploration as well. Yeah, I mean, so if you, I don't know if I can go back to the design space here. We actually have that as a class of things here. Inputs. So if you look under the input dimension, so I didn't focus on this. We have in-car controls as one of them. So there's some works that do focus on like, using in-car controls for games. So that's part of our categorization, but we didn't explicitly focus on that in our cross-car game work. Great. Thank you. And uh, we do have one, time for one quick question while the next one says up. Hi, Vero van der Nabelen, KU Leuven. Uh, in follow-up of Floyd Muller's, currently there's a regulation that all cars need to be drive-by-wire, meaning that you always need to be able to take over driving by the steering wheel. So regulation currently would not allow the suggestion, <laughs> at least not in the EU. Maybe it's different in Australia. But yeah. All right, let's take, thank Mathieu again.